I grew up in West Springfield. It was part of Springfield in 1734, but a certain Samuel Hopkins, Reverend of West Springfield, somehow found out about the beautiful land out here along the Housatonic River in Stockbridge. And he went before the general court after doing a preliminary investigation, and he basically told them that this would be a perfect place for an Indian mission, a mission to the Housatonic people under Chief Kankapat and Umpanchini. These native people were sadly neglected under their beautiful black locusts, which seem to favor this part of the Housatonic Valley, as well as the silver maples that are everywhere. Today, Stockbridge is one of the jewels of the Berkshires, as the golf course behind me is a testament to. But it all started with the Reverend Samuel Hopkins, who convinced the general court to create an Indian mission here. And he sent John Sargent, one of his acolytes, out here to minister to the needs of the most neglected native people. The Housatonic. And the Housatonic two chiefs were not in agreement. One, Umpanchini, said, since when has the white man had such concern and care for us? We've been neglected for years as you fought your wars against the native peoples of your valleys, and now you look at ours. It may be that we make a deal with you that our children will be very upset with. Tonkapot, though, sided with the general court, the government of Boston, and Tonkapot agreed. And ultimately, they got a church, a church in exchange for 52 square miles of land and I don't know how many hundred pounds of pelts, beaver pelts, probably muskrat, otter, and today, this is what we have to remember them. And it's dedicated with a beautiful stone. It was put up in 1877 and then it was added to again. The ancient burial ground of the Stockbridge Indians. And then it says, and it's hard to read, Friends of our fathers, it said. You'll notice the flags decorating this monument, and this is a legitimate native burial site. And it probably extended beyond that fence. Now, the Stockbridge had probably been out here for maybe a hundred years before the coming of John Sargent and the building of the mission, many of them coming from as far south and west as New York City. And we know they knew the environs of New York City pretty well, because they fought with distinction in the American Revolution in a couple of actions down in New York City, losing, I think it was five of their great chiefs at the Battle of King's Bridge in 1778. It sounds right, but I might be off. I'll look it up. But this is a native burial site. Beautiful obelisk. This wasn't put up by the native people. This was put up by the fathers of the town of Stockbridge. The European has this way with stone. There's obelisks all over the place put up at the beginning of the 20th century. Another one that looks almost exactly like it is in the Great Swamp in Rhode Island, the site of the uh, Narragansett village that was attacked by the combined forces of Rhode Island, Plymouth, and Massachusetts Bay. And there's a big obelisk like this there. These obelisks really have nothing to do with the native people who didn't build in stone up here, but it looks cool. And you can imagine under these black locust trees are the moldering bones of hundreds of native people. I'm here in August. You can see the westering sun right now on this nice August night. And the native people at this time would have been getting in their harvest of squash and beans, preparing for the corn harvest. They certainly would have been fishing the Housatonic River. 
<laughs> with nets and clubs and spears and whatever else they used. And they would have been doing a little bit of hunting, especially waterfowl that strayed too close. It wasn't time for the deer hunt yet. But it's interesting being here in such a place. Stockbridge has been <laughs> a <laughs> vacation mecca for the who's who of not only America, but Europe. Wow. This tree had a recent lightning strike. Look at, you got a fissure going up the tree, and look at it going down. I'm pretty sure that's what that was. Anyways, I get distracted, as you know. So, native people would have been doing their August thing right now, getting ready for the big harvest of corn, which would take place in September. And, Sergeant, you know, you ask yourself, what happened to Hopkins? Who knows what happened to Hopkins? He came up with the idea. He probably got a commission for it. Meanwhile, Reverend Sergeant was apparently a man of principle. And Sergeant built a mission only about mm, half a mile up the road, which is still there, the mission house. It's been moved a couple times. And he dedicated himself for many years to teach the native people about Christ and congregational Christianity. I love seeing a speeding Prius. The Stockbridge lived side by side with Sargent and with later ministers, and even more important than Sargent would have been Jonathan Edwards, who was one of the great luminaries, one of the great men of the colonial period he was a minister here in Stockbridge, I think the third minister, for six years. They weren't the, the happiest years for him, but they have a monument to Jonathan Edwards here in the community. Housatonic Valley here in the Southern Berkshires is beautiful, absolutely beautiful. And the native people that lived here probably were living on land that other native people had lived on before them. There had been waves of epidemics that had crisscrossed New England from around 1515 right through the coming of the pilgrims and beyond. They're gone now. They lost so many men in the French and anywhere. They sent two companies of native people to help Robert Rogers. He only trusted the Housatonics, the Stockbridge Indians they were called. He only trusted them to provide him with good intelligence about the dispositions of the French up at Crown Point and St. Francis and in the Montreal region, up in the northern part of New England, which was a howling wilderness. The only native people he trusted were the Stockbridge, not the Mohawk, who were allied closely to the English, not the Oneida or the Seneca, the Cayuga or the Onondaga. The Stockbridge were who he trusted. And in the American Revolution, they remained friends, not to the British, but to their Massachusetts brethren. And they fought again with distinction. By the end of these wars, they had lost so many men, so many warriors who were farmers, that they couldn't work this land anymore. I mean, they were farming side by side with the Europeans here. There were something like 18 houses here. 18 European houses at the time of the revolution. They were farming side by side with them, pledging temperance to the ministers, doing what they needed to do. But ultimately, there were so few of them that they were, I guess, tricked into going to the Oneida lands out west, out by Syracuse, New York, where they would... Uh, stay for a time until they'd be tricked again and end up in Wisconsin. They still come back, usually in August every year. They'll come back to their sacred homelands. And just to our south, and I think we can see it, the Stockbridge have just been given the option of buying the northern portion of Monument Mountain. So they once again have land in the Housatonic Valley that they love so much so they can hear the sound of screaming electric vehicles and Priuses as the sun sets in August.
in the gloaming. Speaking of gloaming, a lot of great people came to Stockbridge, as I was saying earlier. A who's who of American wealth from the early 19th century right through even today. I mean, I'm down the road from Tanglewood. Investment brokers, industrialists, now Silicon Valley magnets, movie stars, actors, actresses, poets, Matthew Arnold, the great Matthew Arnold. Went on a fishing trip on the Housatonic River, just like I just finished. Norman Rockwell's Norman Rockwell's house is about a half a mile that way. And Norman Rockwell played this course. He painted people playing this course too. 